Well, good morning. Thank you guys so much for having me here. I am a junior at Manhattan Christian College. I am studying to get my degree in theological research with an emphasis in theology. All those words basically just mean that I'm studying a lot and in my room just going through flashcards on a regular basis. <laughs> my goal would be to be a preacher. That is what I feel like God has called me to do and that is something that I am super passionate about and that I am excited to share God's word. Um, if you guys would bow your heads and pray with me, we'll get started for today. Dear Lord, thank you so much for everyone here. God, we pray for them and as they come into these walls that they can be encouraged with your word, God. Let your word we speak to them and give them strength and courage to go out and do your will. God, we lift up our human bodies to you. As I know my voice seems to be failing, Lord, I pray that you give us the strength to continue on. Yes. And it's in your holy name that all God's children pray. Yes. Amen. 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 Alrighty. Those of us in the workforce know that there's 52 weeks in a year, 12 months in a year, and usually on a bi-weekly pay period, we seem to hit this point, for me it's around October, where the pay periods are sometimes three weeks apart, or sometimes they're every week kind of thing, just because there's not simply enough, an even number to divide it by. And for those of us on an hourly wage, we hit that October point, we hit three weeks going by, and we get to this time of the month where we start to run a little bit short. Bills, they stay, rent is due on the 1st, electric is due on the 12th, cable is due on the 16th, <laughs> but our paycheck just kind of gets a little bit off there. And it was at one of those points, my freshman year in college, that I was sitting there and like, all right, cool, not a big deal, it was gonna be okay, but my friend on the other hand comes and sits in my room, sits down on my bed, and starts explaining to me how this has really hurt him and how he did not prepare for this ahead of time. And slowly but surely, I start to pick up in his story that he hasn't eaten since Friday night, Friday afternoon at noon, because he didn't budget correctly and money just became shorthanded and he was just shy of the pay period. He didn't have money to go out. Living in the dorms, we have a meal plan. You get X amount of meals per week, and above that, it's up to you to figure it out. And so my friend had used up all his meals, and he got to Friday night, and now Saturday night, he's sitting on my bed, just explaining to me the situation, not really asking for handouts or anything, but just letting me know. I look him in the eyes and say, all right, we're going on an adventure. And so I grab my friend, we get in our car, in my car, we drive to Taco Bell. And it's at that point that I see the look on his face of, uh-oh, I don't have any money. And he's like, all right, I'm just gonna chill out, play with you, you're cool, we'll hang out. I don't know why he thinks I'm cool. But anyway, he says, he says well, I'm just here for the hangs. And I said, you know what, man? I have a little bit extra, so why don't you get whatever you want, and it's on me. And the look on his face as I order him Taco Bell. <laughs> Never seen anybody that excited for Taco Bell in my life. And this kid, he was ecstatic for Taco Bell. Now, I tell you the story, not to say look at what I did and look at what I could do, but I tell you the story to show you how God uses those closest to him to bless the majority. Today's story we're going to be picking up in the book of Mark, chapter 8. This is, the, this is Mark's account of the feeding of the 4,000. Now, a lot of you are going to be familiar with the feeding of the 5,000. If we remember back to Sunday school, that's the word Jesus takes the loaves of bread and he breaks them and there's seven loaves and he's like, thank God for the bread and then God multiplies the bread and it feeds the entire crowd. This story is a similar situation in where Jesus takes a little bit of food and allows it to feed a multitude of crowds. The story is a little less well known because the story where Jesus feeds 5,000 with the seven loaves of bread is found in Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 9, and John 6. Whereas the feeding of the 4,000 is only recorded in Mark and Matthew. So it makes a little sense there as to why the Sunday school lessons would be more focused on the 5,000 with the seven loaves of bread, because that's the more well-known story. It's in all four of the synoptic Gospels. But today's story is a little different. So now, thinking back historically, <clears throat> sorry, thinking back historically, paper was extremely expensive. I mean, it wasn't like it is today where you could go pick up a ream of printer paper for $2. This was really expensive. So why would Mark record both accounts of feeding and Jesus' miracles if indeed it's the same miracle, right? Jesus takes little and feeds the crowd. So we have this question of why he's recording this. 
For Mark, the feeding of the 5,000 seems to symbolize Jesus' provision for the Jews. So Jesus is coming down to earth and he says, look, I am providing for you. The Jews can now see this and they're of faith. But the feeding of the 4,000 is a little different. It's more towards the Gentiles. And you see at that time, the Gentiles were excluded from the church. The Jews were like, you're not us. You're not chosen. You're filthy. You're dirty. You're unclean. We don't want you in the church. And so this is at the point where Jesus is saying, no, look, we're including the Jews with us. We're feeding. We're eating with them. And so that is why Mark includes the differences here. I think it's also important to note that Mark's gospel account from chapter 6 to 8 are very cyclical. He runs through the same four stories two times through. So we start with the feeding, and then he gets on a boat and leaves. And then from the boat, he leaves, and then now he's talking to the Pharisees. And then from the Pharisees, he's going on. And then it repeats itself again. Just to be simple, these two chapters, Mark repeats the same four stories, just when Jesus performs them again for a second time. And so we wonder why. Again, paper's out of premium. It's going to cost him a lot of money to do this. So why does he do it? Why does he emphasize these four stories so much? But this leaves us today. We're in Mark chapter 8, and this is the second time Jesus is feeding the crowd. We have the first time of the 5,000, and then now we're on to the 4,000. And he must have had them on the edge of this, their seat. Because we, we have this, we pick up, we're picking up the story where Jesus is teaching for three days. I don't know about you, but I don't know if I can sit there and listen to somebody preaching for three days without eating, without doing anything, but just sitting there and listening. But Jesus, he has the crowd. He's got them so in tune with him and his speaking that they just sit there in awe for three days. And it's at this point that Jesus realizes they're going to need something to eat. Because they travel, they travel on foot. They didn't have cars back then. So they travel on foot to get there. And so Jesus knowingly gives send them away. He can't in a good conscience do that without feeding them. So that's where we pick up. If you'll turn with your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 8. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered, they had nothing to eat. He called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint along the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered, how can we feed these people with the bread in this distant place? Now, so far in the story, we've been introduced to a couple of different groups of people. We have the disciples who are up there with Jesus, and then now we have the crowd. So imagine with me right now, we're the crowd. So we're sitting in the crowd, and you look around you, and you just see the sea of people. Because it records that there's 4,000 men in the crowd. In the Bible times, the way that they would number people is by the amount of men that showed up. They didn't include women and children in the numbers. Why? It was just a cultural thing. So realistically, if you think about this, if we have 4,000 men, and each man had a wife, and maybe two kids or three kids, the Bible only recorded one person. And there could be upwards of four other people or five other people or just that one person if the band came traveling alone. But realistically, there's a possibility that there's nine to 13,000 people in the crowd that day. This is a pretty big crowd. I don't know the last time I sat in front of nine to 13,000 people and just realized it. So we're in this crowd, right? We're thinking like that. We look around and we see the sea of people. And only a couple rows in front of you, you can see Jesus teaching. You can see the sweat on his brow as he's just so fervently and passionately teaching the crowd. And you look to your right, and you see this guy he's sitting there. His eyes are open, and he hasn't blinked. And you look at him, and you're like, well, this guy hasn't blinked in a while. Mm -hmm. So then you're like staring at him, and then you have to be like, oh, I can't, I can't stare at him because it's weird if I'm staring at him. He hasn't blinked, so you're just wondering how long he can go. He's just, uh. And then you look over here to your left, and over here you have this guy who's just scribbling. And he's fervently writing. You're just like, wow, how could that guy keep writing that fast for so long? And then he starts to turn the page, and you're like, whoa, what is this guy? He's just writing down all the notes. Should I be taking notes? And then you see immediately right in front of you, your wife. She's at peace because the family is all together. And then you see your kids. As they're sitting there, they're not fighting. They're just listening. And you're at peace 
because your family's together, your kids aren't fighting. They're all paying attention to this guy, Jesus, and his teachings. Now, a crowd of 13,000 people, you would think it would be really loud. But I'm envisioning this crowd without a murmur, without so much as people talking. Because as you're sitting there, you can hear Jesus speaking. Even though there's 30,000 people around you, you can still hear him like he's standing next to you. Because everybody in the crowd is not interested in sidebar conversations. No, they're interested in what Jesus is teaching and his message to us. So the crowd is silent. And the longer you listen, the more goosebumps you start to get. Because the more passionately this man starts teaching, and as he keeps going on and on and on, he's just proclaiming the truth of God and the love that God has for us. And it's something so passionately involved in your heart that you just can't turn away from it. That's the crowd. Now what about the disciples? These disciples have done this before. This is Mark's second time recording such an event that's happened. So by this point in their ministry, the disciples know, all right, where it's expected. This guy, Jesus, he likes to go on tangents, so we need to have food because he's just going to keep rambling on for a couple days, a couple hours, so we just need to be prepared for that. And so his disciples have some bread with them because they know that Jesus is going to go along. They know he's a long-winded guy. They know he doesn't know how to land a plane very quickly. <laughs> Now, I can just imagine the look when Jesus asked them how much bread they have on doubting Thomas's face. Just the, the, the awestruck fear of, uh oh, what are we going to do? Jesus wants us to feed a crowd. We only have seven loaves of bread. Uh oh. And so, as, as we go through this, we can just imagine and how all these characters are fitting into place. And so, with that, we have God's call for those closest with them to act. We're going to go back to chapter 8, verses 5 and 7. And Jesus asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down. And he took seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they sat before the crowd. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. When Mark is describing the crowd, he uses the Greek word prosmenusin here. Prosmenusin gives us this idea that the crowd is intentionally made it here. The crowd just didn't happenstantially come by this teaching of Jesus. They intentionally made the efforts to go there, and they intentionally made the efforts to sit and to remain among Jesus' teachings. This is all intentional here. Everyone wants to be here. So now, walk with me for a second here. We're in the crowd. We knew we'd have to travel a long way, so we brought a little bit of food with us, but we had no idea it was going to last for three days. And so now the food ran out. So you look over to see your neighbor, guy who hasn't blinked yet, but like, hmm, does he have any food? No, no, no food for him. Guy who is too busy writing, no, no food. So now you realize you have two daughters, and they're both young, and they're not going to want to walk the entire way back home. So you're going to have to probably carry them. And now you start wondering, I haven't eaten for a couple days. Do I have the strength to carry them home? Do I have the strength to pick them up and to walk them back home? And it's almost as if Jesus can read your mind. Because it's at that point that he breaks from his teaching. And he says, all right, disciples, what are we going to do? We can't send them away. Because they're, they surely won't make it. So we need to feed them. And so he, Jesus calls his disciples, those closest to him, and says, all right, what do we have? And that's what they answer. The response is seven. The Bible doesn't record any feelings that they have or any kind of thoughts. They just simply say, we have seven. This is what we have to offer, Lord. This is it. This is all. And they, they gave what little they had. They didn't ask any questions. And I think this is such a great example to look at about giving. They not know how on earth God is going to use their seven loaves of bread to feed 13,000 people. But yet they still gave. And as great as an example as this is, I think it could be easy for us to get caught up in the idea of, well, the disciples gave everything, so we need to give everything. With no questions. Next time the church does a building project, we've got to sell a boat, sell a house, sell the kids, we've got to give it, all, give it all to God so that we can continue on with our blessing. But I want you to know that this idea, this idea, it's okay to wrestle with the idea of giving and how much we should give and what we should give. Because imagine, the Bible does not record this, but imagine the disciples' thoughts. 
We have to out Thomas. Uh oh. How are we gonna pay for this? How are we gonna eat? Oh, it's all over. Oh no, here we go again. Jesus giving up everything we got. <laughs> and what about Judas? You see Judas' mind going in the business mind. Alright. We charge each person this many to an eye, then we can make this much money, which will further our ministry to keep going on, and then I can pocket that much on top of that. <laughs> or Peter. Jesus is fair boy. Yeah, Jesus, you got this. You could do this. He doesn't got this. I don't know that guy. Oh, Jesus, yeah, yeah, yeah. God. <laughs> but those thoughts, it, with those thoughts, it's so important to know that God's plan is for us to be willing to give and to trust Him. And this is where our story is going to pick back up. To His disciples' agreement, Jesus gives thanks to God for the bread and the fish, breaks it, and then has His disciples begin to distribute it. So we have the call to give and what's going to happen with the gift? We can continue on in verses 8 and 9. And they ate and they were satisfied. They were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over. Seven baskets full. And they were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. They ate and they were satisfied. Anywhere from 9,000 to 13,000 people ate that day, and they were satisfied. They did not just eat like a little loaf of bread like communion. No, no. They ate and they were satisfied so much so that they could go out and continue on to their journeys and make it home safely. And they did not just get a bite. And to have seven baskets of leftovers. The idea of a basket here is bigger than a laundry hamper. It's this basket that is huge that you would be able to almost lie down in is how big of a basket this would have been. It's seven of them left over. We only had like seven loaves of bread. And these aren't just the loaves of bread that we go buy at the supermarket. They didn't have all the fancy yeast and stuff, so it would have probably been a little bit thinner. Could have possibly been a little more burnt because the supermarket breads are always so perfect. <laughs> and so you don't want to eat the burnt part, so you just break it off and then you pass it on to the next person. But because God, Jesus gave thanks to the, for the bread to God and blessed it, God blessed the bread and allowed it to feed 13,000 people that day and still have leftovers. God provides no matter what. And it can be easy for us to be swept up in the idea that writing a check is the only way to be generous. And if we don't sell the bow or sell the kids, then we're not generous. But I want to remind you that money is not the only thing that we have to give. Each and every one of us is part of the body as a whole. And we all have different gifts, different strengths, different talents, and different things to give to the kingdom of God. It's not just our pocketbooks that can give. We have our time. We have our hands and we have our feet. We have our voice. We have our cupboard with cans of food in it that we can give. We have so much to give. Now, I don't know what that looks like for you. Whether that's making a turkey dinner for the next door neighbor who can't afford it. Whether that's patching up their fence because you're really good with masonry and you know how to do that. Or whether that's simply just going into your cupboard and grabbing a couple of those cans of food and bringing it down to the homeless shelter so that people can have food to eat. Whatever that is, whatever God has put on your heart to give, I challenge you to give that because it's amazing what God can do with what little we have. Those who go as closest to God, what little we have we can give, God can bless it and multiply it. The disciples gave seven loaves of bread and it fed 13,000 people. Imagine what we could do with our giving, what we have to give to God. If we give, if our giving to God, imagine the impact it could make. God uses those closest with them to bless the majority. He takes whatever we have, blesses it, multiplies it, so that he can reach his people. people. And what an awesome that is take part of Church, today we looked at what it looked like to what it would have been like in the crowd. How drawn in the teacher would have been. How we would have been sitting there with our family. How awestruck it would have been. Just immersed in Jesus' teaching. And after that, we looked at the disciples' role during Jesus' teaching. We looked at what it would have been like to be a disciple at that time. How they would have been ready for Jesus' call at any point because they would have known Jesus is long-winded, so we've got bread. And we saw their willingness to give up what they had, not knowing how it was going to be returned to them, and not knowing how it was going to work, but they just gave. Then we heard those words of Jesus asking them, what do you have? And that's when the disciples said, said, that's it. 
That's all we got, God. Now what can you do with that? As the crowd began, so too with Jesus. Three days had passed, but they were still regenerated at the end to continue on to make it home after their teaching. So church, as we leave today, is my challenge for us as we walk out of these walls that we can continue on being the church, that we can continue on doing God's work, that we can give all that we have to God, no matter what that is, whatever that looks like for you, whatever that looks like in your walk, that we can give it to God so that He can use it and multiply it. We're about to be entering one of the hardest times of the year for a lot of people. A lot of people struggle throughout this time, whether it be with depression or finances or whatever it may be. This time is struggling. And church is a body of believers. I believe it is our call to come together and to reach out to those who are hurting, whether that be within the body or outside of the body. It is our job to go and reach them. God has blessed us so much. And it is our job to give back. However seemingly small, whatever may it be a Taco Bell meal to a friend in college, or whether it be something greater. Whatever it is, it is my prayer that we can be willing to give that up to God so that He can use it to further His kingdom. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you so much for these people. We pray for their hearts as we go about this time of year. Lord, we pray for encouragement if we may need it, as this time of year is fairly difficult. God, we lift up your name and your power. And it's in your holy name that all guys children pray out. Amen.